how important is the tissue specificity? Where is IGF-1? Where is it um, activating mTOR? Is it in muscle cells versus in other cells in the body? And I kind of have this theory that if you're driving IGF-1 up, but it's in muscle cells, that's a different context to someone driving up IGF-1 who's metabolically not healthy and is sedentary. That's true. I agree with that, by the way. Now, I, I agree with what, what you're saying, but keep in mind with, um, that people who are generally um, focused on bodybuilding and performance, they want to get, go for excessive muscle growth for performance and for looks, and, and, uh, and to get to eat enough calories and to have IGF-1 levels to maximize their size is not favorable for longevity. You know, so like take me, for example. I was an athlete most of my life. Um, and I could bench press a lot of weight for my hand. Do you know? I was very physically fit. I could jump up on tables and I'm very um, for my size. But I didn't try to maximize size. In order to get bigger than 150 pounds or 155 pounds, I'd have to eat more protein, more animal products. If I want to get to 165 or 170 at 510, I can't do it on my diet. I have to go off my diet to eat more food that way. And I could, and I probably wouldn't be as bad off as a person who got to 165. Um, who was a, who did it through being sedentary in the same diet. The extra exercise made it safer, but not as safe and not as longevity promoting as eating right and keeping my weight at 150 pounds. I still have good musculature, a six pack, and the ability to do 70 push-ups and 10 chins and to be able to bench press more than my body weight. But I don't want to push myself to a degree of performance that would be um, not achievable with a healthy diet and because I don't want to sacrifice my chance for maximizing human longevity. So I think that's a good point about strength, though, that I think is lost is that because there is this movement towards hypertrophy, building muscle. But when you look at longevity, strength correlates better with longevity than muscle mass. Right. Even though there's some association between strength and muscle mass, you can build strength without building a lot of muscle. Right. Um, yeah, I want to be as fit and strong as I can for my best biological weight, I have a certain set point, and my weight just seems to want to set here. I have to really overeat to get it above that set point. If I undereat, I really, it's still hard for me to drop from the set point. If I overeat, it's hard for me to gain from the set point. I'm trying to eat to maintain my set point with as little food as possible. So I, I want to maintain this degree of musculature and this degree of strength that I can measure in the gym, but I want to do it with the least amount of food as possible not the most amount of food as possible. And the least amount of protein, not the most amount of protein. But I'm saying there's a big difference between the biological effects of animal protein because of plant protein, because the plant protein is not so biologically complete. And the body can make the complete to meet the IGF-1 needs of my exercise needs, but it's too easy to overshoot those needs when you're eating animal protein because it's all biological complete to begin with. So your body doesn't have to make it complete. It doesn't have to manufacture it. It's already there. And it's very easy to overshoot your needs when you're eating animal protein. So the question really is, how much animal protein should a person eat and not overshoot it? And the answer, you know, so I'm, so I'm saying here that... When you say the body doesn't have to make it because it's already complete. Yes. It would, it would be broken down into the amino acids first, though, and then absorbed, right? Yes, but the body, um, the body can digest the bacteria in the gut to increase amino acids. It can, it can digest the lining of the gut itself. The endothelial lining gets digested. So we eat some meat from our own body when we absorb food. And we get amino acids from a mixture of food that's all, also in the interstitial tissue around the digestive tract. So the body has the ability to see a more complete protein that enters the bloodstream for utilization for muscle growth, even when we're not eating complete proteins. The body can still have a complete protein in the blood when we're not eating complete proteins. The body can, can break down even more. If it's missing something or needs more, it can get more of those amino acids for muscle growth if it needs to. Um, by, but if you're eating animal products, it's so easy for the body to overshoot the amount it needs. And now the body's not manufacturing or having enough amino acids in the blood to be biologically useful. It has too much in the blood to be biologically useful. You've overexceeded what you really need. So what does the body do with the excess? And I'm saying that excess has been, there's too much evidence to suggest that excess is unfavorable. And the studies we have showing diets that switch from animal protein to plant protein, which lower 
protein bioavailability, IGF-1 is lower, and other, other um, pro-inflammatory substances go down as well, like TMAO and other um, factors that could create more inflammation, plus the exposure from the other substances in plant foods that are beneficial leads, seems to indicate for lifespan extension. And I'm not really advocating that I don't have to have, um, like I'm f like giving people information so they can utilize it if they want to. You know what I mean? I'm not like forcing people to follow my advice. If they want to get bigger and eat more animal products, they can do it. But I would like them to, but they're most likely um, reducing their longevity potential and eating increasing risk of disease in the process.